A lot of historians will characterize the Suez Crisis as a strategic and military success but a total political failure. This becomes crystal clear over the weekend starting November 2nd, 1956. Despite Israeli success on the ground and Anglo-French domination of the skies, the diplomatic, political, and economic fronts are in complete disarray. But still, Britain and France push on, but they are now gambling with global security. Welcome to a Time Ghost chronological documentary series on the Suez Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Last time, we saw that Britain and France launched phase one of Operation Musketeer Revise, knocking out virtually all of Egypt's air force in an aerial campaign. However, the international reaction was immediate and it was fierce, and a US-backed resolution at the United Nations called for an immediate ceasefire. But against this stormy backdrop, Israel's military, the IDF, continue to make gains in their own Operation Kadesh. The Egyptian military has been largely defeated within Sinai, and with Rafah now secured, IDF Commander-in-Chief Moshe Dayan can focus on taking the entire Gaza Strip. An armored offensive on Gaza City begins at dawn November 2nd from the east, followed by infantry mopping up not long after. The assault is relatively bloodless, and by noon the city is in Israeli hands. Diane hopes he can have the entire strip captured by the end of the day, but logistical issues slow his advance. The remaining Gaza objective is the city of Khan Yunis in southern Gaza. But if all this success has scared Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, he sure isn't showing it. In a speech delivered from Cairo's Al-Azhar Mosque during Friday prayers, he tells his nation, in any place we will fight, from house to house and from village to village. We will fight, like I told you yesterday, to the last drop of blood. We will never surrender. We are building our country, building our history, building our future. Today, that is the slogan of every Egyptian. It galvanizes much of the population. Recruitment centers are soon filled with volunteers willing to fight in the coming people's war. Everywhere Nasser goes, he is greeted with chants of, we will fight. We will never surrender. The nationalist fever even spreads beyond Egypt's borders. In Washington, ambassadors from neighboring countries press the U.S. to take a firmer stance on the crisis unless they want to see people all across the Arab world also rising up. But the passion Nasser has ignited cannot hide the disaster Egypt is facing. Thousands of soldiers and civilians are pouring in from the conflict zone with their war stories for the general public. And intelligence suggests that Britain and France soon plan to invade Egypt with the intention of full regime change. Once again, some of Nasser's top generals press him to surrender. At a meeting not long after his speech at al ajar his chief of staff, Field Marshal Abdel Hakim Amer, says that Continuing the fight will only bring about more suffering and death, something for which the people will inevitably hate Nasser and his government. Apparently, most of the leadership agrees. Nasser then reportedly flies into a hysteria, ordering an aide to fetch enough bottles of potassium cyanide so that they can all commit suicide right then and there. This supposedly would be more honorable than surrendering. His generals and politicians back down. And going away from the script, I'm actually wondering right now how many bottles of potassium cyanide Nasser has just lying around his residence. But okay, anyhow, Nasser is not the only one facing pushback from his military leadership, though. Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia during World War II, the last Viceroy of India, cousin of Queen Elizabeth II, and currently First Sea Lord of the British Royal Navy, was already against this whole thing from the start coming close to resigning over it back in August. On November 2nd, he makes his misgivings clear again in a handwritten letter to British Prime Minister Anthony Eden, begging him to call off the land invasion. Eden responds by phoning Mountbatten to thank him for his honesty. He then promptly says it is impossible to go back and hangs up. But Mountbatten is not alone. Many foreign office officials are outraged, especially as most of them were never briefed on the secret Sevre agreement that planned the attacks. Their misgivings are not helped by a severe economic crunch looming on the horizon. The Anglo-French intervention has led to the pound plummeting in value as financiers across the world sell sterling in a panic. 
to stop the currency being devalued any further, the Bank of England makes aggressive use of their already dangerously low reserves. This all means that in just the first two days of November, they have lost 50 million pounds. The best way to make up for this loss would be with American support, either through a loan or, or a waiver on existing debts, but US actions have so far indicated pretty strongly that such support probably will not be forthcoming. Alongside the drain in finances, and in fact fueling it, is a looming oil crisis. As you'll know from previous episodes, Western Europe relies on the Middle East and the Suez Canal for most of its oil. But Nasser's block ships in the canal mean that this supply is now cut off. There are now also rumors that the US is considering an oil embargo on the aggressor countries. On November 2nd, British Foreign Minister Selwyn Lloyd tells the cabinet that if this happens, Britain might have to forcefully occupy Kuwait and Qatar to secure their supply. To make the situation even more desperate, after midnight on November 3rd, elements of the Syrian army blow up pumping stations located in Syria, sabotaging the flow of oil even more. In an intelligence report, the CIA estimates that 86% of Western Europe's oil supply is affected. President Eisenhower has the means to solve this, America's powerful oil industry can make up the Middle Eastern shortfall in Europe using oil delivered from the Western Hemisphere. But again, he is not permitting any thought of this to go ahead until a ceasefire is accepted by all sides. But still the British and French push on. November 3rd is the day that phase two of Operation Musketeer Revise begins. The objective here is an aero-psychological campaign that will break both Egyptian morale and their economy. Supreme Allied Commander General Charles Kightley and the rest of the task force commanders order strikes against railway lines, roads, bridges, barracks, and military depots. Taking down Radio Cairo, one of Nasser's critical methods of propaganda, is also an objective. Successful strikes on a transmitter station take it off the air, leaving Britain and France to broadcast a message to Egyptians telling them, we shall bomb you wherever you hide. The date of the actual invasion is also pushed forward. Since the matter was transferred to the UN's General Assembly on October 31st, the French have been pressuring the British to speed things up so that it's not all over before they can send in their ground troops. In the afternoon of the 2nd, French Foreign Minister Christian Pinot flies to London to lobby Eden on that matter. Eden is receptive, and the next day new plans, codenamed Operation Telescope, are approved by the British-led task force. They are relatively modest, not nearly as aggressive as Pinot wants, but with mounting pressure even from his own cabinet and continued accusations of being a murderer in the House of Commons, Eden cannot allow the changes to be too radical. The main amphibious landings are now to take place on the 6th, preceded by parachute drops at dawn on the 5th. On the ground on the 3rd, the IDF begin their final push in Gaza to take Khan Yunus. The fighting here is fierce. First, Israeli armor has to punch holes in a defensive perimeter set up by Palestinian soldiers. After this, more armor and infantry pour through and storm their positions. By noon, the city is mostly secured. With all of Gaza now under Israeli control, Diane and the IDF only still have to secure the Straits of Tehran to round Operation Kadesh off as a complete success. But within Khan Yunus and the adjacent UN refugee camp, the IDF report continuing resistance. In their operation that day to quell it, Israeli soldiers reportedly execute at least 275 unarmed civilians, around half of them refugees. It will become known as the Khan Yunus Massacre and will soon feature in a UN report. The report will also include the Israeli side of the story, that those killed were actively resisting IDF occupation. The reported massacre will go largely forgotten with little further investigation conducted. But throughout all this bloodshed, President Eisenhower has been working on getting the situation back to something he can control. He's come around to a proposition by Lester Pearson, Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs, for a large UN peacekeeping force that can patrol a demilitarized zone within Sinai. Pearson has been pushing this for a while. He even made sure Canada abstained on the previous U.S. ceasefire resolution precisely because it did not provide for such a force. 
He's been working on getting support for one since, and with American backing, it now looks like it might be a reality. Another critical ally that is emerging for Eisenhower is India. Under Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, India has led the non-aligned movement, of which Egypt is also a big part. A substantial commitment of Indian troops to the peacekeeping force will legitimize it and be more likely to be accepted by Nasser. And Eisenhower needs all the allies he can get, especially after his master statesman, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, is forced to undergo immediate surgery for colon cancer complications in the early hours of November 3rd. He will continue working on the crisis from his hospital bed, but the next UN General Assembly will have to convene without him. That assembly gathers in New York at 8 p.m. It is another grueling session, but after midnight, resolutions 998 and 999 are approved by an overwhelming majority. Resolution 998 is sponsored by Canada and directs Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld to submit a plan for a peacekeeping force within 48 hours. Resolution 999 is proposed by an Indian-led Afro-Asian bloc and renews the Assembly's demand for a ceasefire and obliges all parties to accept it within 12 hours. To the shock of everyone present, the Israeli ambassador to the UN, Abba Iban, agrees in principle to the ceasefire, provided Egypt does as well. Iban thinks that the IDF still have enough time to complete their final objectives before having to comply with the ceasefire. But he's soon receiving anxious calls from the Israeli Foreign Ministry, and Britain and France are furious. Their officials scramble to get him to retract his agreement to a ceasefire. There is also the question of how they are going to respond to the ceasefire themselves. The French are still pushing for immediate invasion, but Britain's politicians are more cautious. Eden and the most senior members of his cabinet agree that Britain should accept the peacekeeping force, but not the ceasefire. They can argue that the increasing chaos in the region requires immediate police action that the UN cannot provide. We've stepped in because the United Nations couldn't do so in time. If the United Nations will take over this police action, we shall welcome it. Until a United Nations force is there, ready to take over, we and the French must go on with the job until the job is done. But the rest of the cabinet is more divided. They all meet at 6.30 p.m., an hour and a half before the deadline. From Downing Street, the ministers can hear the noise of 30,000 anti-war protesters in Trafalgar Square chanting, Eden must go. The cabinet is divided and locked in a stalemate. Some want a 24-hour delay on the invasion. Eden cables General Kately to ask how feasible this is. Kately says, well, yeah, it's possible, but it would mean a significant loss of morale while being a big boon to Egyptian troops. More indecision. But then suddenly, with less than an hour before the deadline, the ministers learn that Israel has retracted its acceptance of a ceasefire, claiming it was a misunderstanding. The entire cabinet apparently laughs in relief. The attack will go ahead. The same night, Nasser travels to Port Said, hoping to boost the morale of his troops there. During his journey, he sees countless destroyed Egyptian vehicles and tanks littering the road. He reportedly mutters to himself, I was defeated by my army. But it is not over yet. Nasser may have already lost against the Israeli invasion, and the British and French certainly have military capabilities far surpassing Egypt's, but the international community is firmly against the Allied intervention, and Britain's and France's economies are in dire straits because of their actions, and soon, a certain superpower might do much more than proposing sanctions and offering denunciations. Busy with an uprising in Hungary, the Soviets have mostly stayed on the sidelines so far. But if they move against Britain, France, and Israel, they will be threatening not merely military aid, not even military intervention, but full-out nuclear war. 
If you would like to learn about a time when international peacekeeping definitely did not work, then check out our Between Two Wars episode on appeasement. You can find it right here. Our Time Ghost member of the week is Noob Tella. It is thanks to people like Noob Tella that this and, well, all of our series are possible. So to get more awesome mini-series like this one, join us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time.